Okay, I want to welcome you all tonight, this huge crowd. We're going to have a, um, an hour and a half of uh, astrology, and I'm going to show you just exactly what you are going to be learning in the, the five-week course we're going to have, which is really um, a course that will teach you not only to read your own chart and understand it, but to read others as well, and then understand the mechanics and the dynamics of astrology, because they're really, I can teach anybody the mechanics very well. I mean, that's one thing to learn, but the dynamics of it is something that you don't always grab, and people need to have that sense of the power of these aspects and what they interpret out to. What we're going to see is uh, uh, also, I'm very biblical oriented in my astrology. Um, uh, sometimes that's a challenge for people because uh, we, I had a uh, lady here um, the other night that's got a Jewish background and she found it a bit challenging. And I know that, okay, and that's okay. But the reason is because astrology, and as Christians don't realize this, is filled with astrological knowledge. Um, and they would have you believe that it's foreign to their belief systems, that you really should not be studying and looking at astrology. Well, the, the, I'm going to share with you just some of, the, uh, some of the knowledge that the Christians miss because they don't understand astrology and they don't want to embrace it. And we're going to look at that today, and uh, I'll give you some of the uh, scriptures that uh, show you just how powerful it was understood. So, um, this is a scripture from uh, the Old Testament in the Psalms, and it says, The heavens declare the glory of God in the firmament. And the actual original translation was not heavens, it was planets declare the glory of God. And the firmament, which was really heaven, showed his handiwork. And night under night showeth knowledge, and day under day uttereth speech. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And in keeping them is their great reward. And moreover, by them is thy servant warned. By them is thy servant warned. I mean, think about that. What are they talking about here? You can see the intention of that whole scripture if you follow it through to its conclusion when they say keeping them and look at the night under day night showeth knowledge and day under day utter speech that's what the planets do okay and uh, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard do you know that astrology is understood throughout the world it's a universal language it's maybe one of the few i, I think i think it is a few i don't know of any other language that's understood Symbols are universal. They're understood everywhere. Okay, music would be a, a good example of uh, a universal language. Um, what does it mean? By, I understand the night and night show us knowledge, and day and day utter speech. It's that they're, they're, they've got a message. They're messengers of God. Okay, the angles of the planet. Does that word sound familiar? Angles, angels. Yes, okay, yes. Uh, you got it, I, the, the, the intention's the same. Okay, the planetary angles were planetary angels, okay? So the word's been translated into angels and made into some mysterious meaning. So, okay, and there's no voice is not heard in keeping them. What does it mean by keeping them? Keeping their positions, knowing where they're at and understanding their, their relationship to this earth. And uh, that's what they mean by that. And by them is thy servant warned, and definitely that's the case. If you understand their message, you are warned. You're given, if you would, predictive knowledge of what's coming in your life. And that's for sure about astrology. So that's one scripture, okay? Uh, the word lunatic is a biblical word. It literally means to be afflicted by the moon. Now, I've heard of sunstroke, but I've ever heard of moonstroke. So, you know, how do you get that word out of there, okay? Uh, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. This actually sounds like a case of epilepsy, doesn't it? Probably back then that's what it was. So, but they were asking Jesus to heal him, okay? So, this is... He created the sun, the moon, and the stars for signs and for seasons. That's in the first chapter of Genesis. It didn't just say for seasons. 
but for signs and for seasons. What signs mean? Signs means exactly what it says. It's a signal or a message to you, okay? Okay, so this is in Judges. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Sisera was a captain in the army. How can they fight against him? He lost the battle. He not only lost the battle, he lost his life. Okay, how can the stars in their courses fight against the commander in the army of the Canaanites? If it, Scripture says it did, okay? How do you get around that? The Christians don't want you to understand all these things. They don't want to share this to you because this is contrary to what they want you to believe. They'd rather you don't look at astrology <clears throat> because if you do, you're going to see the roots of all the, the mysteries of the of scriptures. You're going to see how Saturn evolved into Satan. You're going to understand the mechanics of uh, uh, so much of the mysteries that's been given down from Pythagoras before Christ and different mystery schools. You're going to learn the mysteries. And that's what's going to take you on a path that's going to really let you understand and come to grips with some very profound truths. And the most profound truth is that the temple of the living God is you. You are the temple. And it's not down on 4th and Main. And you don't have to prostrate yourself in front of a priest and confess your sins. That's really not the truth. But the, they want that hold and that power and that money that comes with that belief system, okay? So, signs in the sun and moon and stars. This is in Luke. This is, the, this is the New Testament. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. What do you think, sea and waves roaring? You ever heard of a tsunami? Hmm? That's prophecies of what's happening today. You're going to see more of those. And there's an actual rational reason, scientifically, why there's going to be more tsunamis. And I can tell you, and I've been telling people this for 30, 40, maybe 50 years since I've been studying all this. The reason is because we're sucking all the oil out of the earth. And when you suck oil out of the earth, that's a very thick, viscous liquid. And they replace it with water. Water has no viscosity. So you have two plates that are being kept apart with this viscous oil. You suck it all out for the drive our cars and run all our machinery, right? And what ends up happening is that movement of those plates, when it moves, it doesn't hit up and run up against that shock absorbing power of that viscous oil. It has nothing to stop it. it. Bam, like that. And boy, you get earthquakes that shake this earth. So that's been prophesied from back in the Christian times. They understood these things were coming. Okay, there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. What are we talking about? Okay. So important that we understand there are two Greek words used for the word, uh, used for world in the biblical uh, translators. Um, okay, and those two words were not what we think they were. They're, they were not world. How many times have you heard Christians talking about the end of the world? Seven references in the Bible, only six of them were mistranslated. They were never talking about the end of the world. Six of the translated words we're referring to aeon, not cosmos. Cosmos is the end of the world. Cosmos, meaning world. The end of the age is aeon, A-I-O-N. And that's what they were referring to, okay? So aeon is used every time, not once is cosmos used. Okay, so, so Christ's disciples said, tell us when shall be these, these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? The disciples are clearly questioning Christ about the end of an era or an age. Upon hearing questioning about this ending, Christ warned disciples. Um, I missed that. I have a question about that. No, it's a good good question. No, uh, it's talking about the end of the uh, Piscean era, mm -hmm. the beginning of the Aquarian age. The end of the Aries age was the um, ending of uh, the sacrificing of lambs. And uh, Aries for 2,000 years, that was the period of the sacrificial lamb. 
uh, Christ was the symbol of that crossing over between Pisces, Aries and Pisces. Pisces is the age of the fish, Ichthus the fish. His name in Greek is Ichthus, it means fish. He made of his disciples 12, Pisces is the 12th sign. 12th sign, Pisces, he, it's a water sign. It's a sign of what, water baptism, bringing people in in water and taking them out like a fish. Um, it's an age, Pisces is an age of belief. What's the Christians been teaching you for 2,000 years? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All things are possible under who? Them that believe. Belief, belief, belief. It's been pounded in our head for 2,000 years. Before that, we had the Aries age and the Tarian age. The Tarian age was the day, times of Moses when Moses said no longer worship what? The golden calf, Taurus. Now it's about the blood of the lamb. Put it on your doorpost, Aries. And your firstborn will be saved. The first signs, Aries. Moses told the people, it's the blood of the lamb now. And he ended the Tarian age. Tarian age didn't end until long into the Aryan age. You know why? What's Taurus? Stubborn? Stubborn. It's stubborn. You're right. He went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, came back down. What are those people doing again? Worshiping a golden calf again. You can't break them. They don't want to, they don't want to turn away from the old way of believing. That is the same story today. People don't want to let go of the Piscean belief systems in the era because now we're moving into Aquarius and Aquarius' key word is I know. Guess what that means? It's an age of knowledge. Who would have known? I would have never known when I began to uncover these mysteries many, many years ago that I would carry in my pocket a little device that has every bit of knowledge I can ever find about any subject anywhere in the world called the internet. Who would have known that? And I could carry a little phone in my pocket and look it up. You got a question about anything, look it up, it's there. The age of knowledge, that's Aquarius. Aquarius is sudden unexpected events. It's earthquakes, it represents earthquakes. Revolutions, despots being brought down around the world. You're seeing that happen already. You know, overthrowing these, these despots, okay, these, these wicked rulers. The people are gaining control, why? Because they're able to communicate with one another instantly. FaceTime, Twitter, all these different social media allows people now to get together and do things as a group instead of individually. And that's why we're seeing the changes we're seeing in this age, okay? A lot of this, I'm jumping ahead because you asked the question, but every age is ushered in by a prophet. And that prophet is a prophet not just in his words, he's a prophet in his life. His life is that prophecy, okay? Moses introduced the Aries age. Aries is a sign of violence. It's ruled by Mars, Aries. And what do we have with that? We have Moses slew a man. Do you remember that? He killed a man, defending a servant that was being beat by him. And he became a fugitive. And every age is ushered in also another way with the killing of children. You remember when Moses was born? All the kids were killed, all of, but what? Moses is preserved alive, hidden in a reed basket, and he's taken in and raised in the palace. How about when Christ was born? Same story again, right? Herod issues an edict, destroy all the children, because he couldn't find what? He couldn't find the star that the Magi, by the way, who were astrologers, did you know that? They were astrologers. Any modern Bible interprets it that way. And they, they wouldn't reveal to him where that star was. Now, how come he couldn't see it? He's, a, he's got his own court physician, you know, uh, astrologers, I'm sure. But he couldn't find that star. You know why? Because it was a star in a chart of a child, not two planets up there right now. There's everybody right now are talking about, hey, you're NASA, saying maybe this conjunction of Jupiter and Venus in the heavens right now, which hasn't happened for 2,000 years to be that close together, might be the star of the Magi. Huh, that's going on right today, right now. Yeah. It's in the news. I just saw that, um, it was on some program, I think it was on the universe. Uh-huh. Um, on um, Facebook, and it was talking about Jupiter and Venus and the star and the planets. Uh-huh. The history, right. Right, and they, they, they thought that it was, uh, it was uh, Jupiter and another... And Venus. And Venus. Exactly. That and they are so misguided. They are so misguided. I stand before you to tell you they're wrong. I remember uh, 
I need to, I, I, always t I always tell my story in front of people. I'm very much, people say, well, Ron, where'd you study? Where'd you learn this? Where'd you? Well, I'm very open about my past. I don't make a secret about it. Nobody's gonna ever come up, oh, you know about Ron? Well, I spent nine years in prison as a young man. And in my early 20s, I was wanted in New York, Maryland, Virginia, Ohio, Texas, and Michigan for armed robberies. And um, I ended up serving nine years in prison. In those nine years, I studied. And it was like a monastic existence for me for nine years. And it forced me to get to know myself and learn and meditate and understand things that I would have never ever looked into. And um, I came out of prison in 1972 after nine years. And uh, I wrote my book and I started teaching because I had uncovered so much I wanted to share it with the world. And I also learned the mysteries. I learned profound truths, powerful truths which uh, has transformed and changed many people's lives when I've shared it with them because they start applying this knowledge and it does change your life. It'll change everything in your life. But anyway, anyway, so that's where it came from, okay? And uh, that's, uh, I've been very blessed. My book has been reviewed by some of the top scholars in the world, two of which said, one of them said it should be compulsory reading for every thinking individual. And the other is a Jewish scholar, a Hebrew scholar, who wrote a beautiful review for the book. The thing is that I'm not a scholar, but I've had wonderful reviews for the book, okay? I also want to tell you that the knowledge that I'm giving you is not just about finding out what's going to happen to you in your chart, you know, but I'm going to teach you how to man maintain control over your life and basically transform and translate conditions that are seemingly destructively destroying into positive things. Uh, and in, in doing that, you'll begin to be a master on this planet instead of a victim. So many people walk on this planet as a victim, okay? Here's a guy I know that's been through hell and back, but he's got an attitude that is transforming. Larry, Larry's an amazing guy. He's, uh, you know, uh, he, he's, um, he's been through what should filled filled many a man, but he's always always got a spirit that won't be beat up and defeated. And that's part of what I've got to share with you is how to do that and how to be that way. Is this Larry? Yep, this is Larry here. Yeah. We met a long time in another meeting. I was giving a lecture at another house yeah. and uh, he was kind enough to come to and share the evening with us. So, so what I'm talking about, I'm gonna try to stay a little bit on the focus of this. I tend to get off on a little tangent and, uh, and I can be a little extemporaneous, you know, and get way off and take you on a journey that I didn't have outlined, but I'll try to keep on this here. So the sign, the, when the scripture says, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And the Christians believe and they teach that this man's gonna come and descend out of the clouds and he's going to save all the worthy. Okay, think about this. He's Superman. All he needs is a little vest in the back and he can fly down. Well, that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. The Christians don't want you to know what I'm gonna teach you. But there's only one sign in the heavens of a man. It's Aquarius. There's my sign and there's Gemini. Gemini is the twins. There's Sagittarius, my sign half horse and half man, when it's not half ass and half man. But there's only one sign of a man, it's Aquarius. And what is that man doing in the heavens? He's pouring out the spirit. He's pouring out a pitcher. And what does the scripture says? <laughs> watch these scriptures, if you can't figure this out, watch this. Okay, the son of man in heaven. Okay, in the clouds, in heaven, in the clouds, okay? The sign of the Son of Man shall appear in heaven, not the, not the Son of Man, but the sign will appear, okay? It's for, for telling a celestial event of some magnitude. But what it's literal meaning in the light of early understanding of the ages and their importance. Christ's disciples said to them, he said, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And the disciples are clearly questioning Christ about the end of this era or age. Remember, I told you it wasn't world. They translated that as world. It was age they were asking, aeon, okay? 
Christ warned his disciples, he said, Behold, I have told you before, wherever they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's, not, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning that cometh out of the east, and it shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, it's a little celestial event. It's as a lightning up there. It's, it's the, you can see it from the east to the west. That's what he's referring to. It's very clear we are concerned of the celestial event. Okay? So, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. No, oh, and I looks like I didn't. I got off on a different direction here, but we'll go there in a minute. So, what what it's referring to is, it says, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And upon my handmaidens too in those days. I'll pour out my spirit, and guess what? They too shall prophesy. Who do you think is pouring out that spirit? Aquarius. You see the symbol, it's in the heavens for you to read. And that's what it's referring to, okay? It's a celestial event. It's not some man coming down out of the clouds. Yes, honey? Because they know that Jesus always referred to himself as the Son of Man. Exactly, exactly. And the Son of God, interesting. And the Son of God. Uh, both, it's interesting. Both. So, so we're, refer we're, referring to, we're referring to a celestial event that the Christians would never want you to understand this truth, okay, and understand what it means. Now, what does it mean? It means we're entering the, the Aquarian age, okay? And uh, <laughs> there'll be, uh, you remember I told you that every age there's ushered in, there's always a killing of children, remember that? Okay, people say, well, I don't see Herod out here. I don't see... You know, uh, the Pharaoh destroying a lot of children. Well, the courts have already done that for us. It's called abortion, quite frankly. Okay? Think about it. How many millions of children are slaughtered every year? Okay, and it was a ruling by the courts that said we can do that, okay? That is the age of the beginning of this age. It always happens with this kind of transition, okay? I could share more with you, but I don't want to get too much into that right now. I want to share with you right now I want to share with you the kingdom of heaven within. Because we've been talking about the heavens without, now I want to share with you the kingdom of heaven within. Okay? <clears throat> the, three, the three symbols that make up all the planets in astrology are the circle, the crescent, and the cross. And I had happened to have this up. I did a little blog the other day. And my wife was recording me doing a blog session. And I put that up, and I thought I'd leave it up for tonight. But this is really a reference to the planet's symbols. If you look at the circle, that represents spirit, it represents conscious mind, it represents your uh, rational being, it's your will. But the circle is only meaningful in terms of astrology when you put a dot in the center. In other words, you've got the centralized focus of that conscious being. And that's where we get the symbol for the sun. The circle represents the spirit, the father, the seed. It represents the life force itself, essence of all things. It's rational, it's the mind, it's intellect, it's thought, it's conscious mind. The crescent represents the subconscious mind. Okay, so the subconscious mind is the soul. And the early Christians referred to the soul and the spirit as two distinct things. People don't recognize this either. It says they had Ruark and they had Nephesh, okay? Nephesh was the, was the soul or the subconscious. The Holy Ghost only meant the subconscious that's integrated. The Holy Spirit referred to the conscious mind, which is integrated. So to have a consciously integrated conscious mind symbolized and represented the Holy Spirit. Now, I could be in great spirits today, and yet I can be suffering on a soul level. You, know, you, know, you understand that concept. And yet, people may not know it, because I've got a bubbly spirit, and I seem not worthy to be fine, but I can be struggling in the in, inside of me with, with, with emotional uh, issues. Because this is the mother, the soul, this is the seed, and this is what gives life to it. The fecundates the seed, it's the subconscious. Okay, this is the essence of the form, the rational, the emotional. This is the mind, this is the heart. This is the intellect, this is the instincts. This is your thoughts, this is feelings. 
the conscious, the subconscious. That's how it works. It's the most ancient of all psychologies. You know, modern psychology has really borrowed all this. Somehow they put it together and they come to the same conclusions. But all this produces something in the real world called the physical world of the cross. And that symbolizes the crucified one. You are all the crucified one at some point in your life. You all go through it. And this is the body, the sun, the word, the blood, the birth, the desires, the five senses, if you would, the physical world of the cross. And these three are one, okay? Sounds similar, doesn't it? The three are one. Sounds like the Trinity, doesn't it? Huh? Christians have been teaching the Trinity for a long time. So, so what's all this got to do with them? Astrology, it's got a lot to do with it because all the planets are made up of those three symbols. All the planets are made up of those symbols. And if you doubt this, that they're understood to be by the ancients in the early days, in the early Christians, that they didn't understand this, listen to these scriptures. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. By the way, the subconscious, the soul, the soul is your subconscious. Holy Ghost, think about that. Where do ghost visions and dreams come from? Your subconscious, right? Holy Ghost just means integrated unconscious or subconscious mind. That's all it means. If I hypnotize you and I put you in a trance and I tell you there's a cat walking across the floor, well, in this house you'd have three of them. You wouldn't have a hard time with that one. But if I told you there was a snake on the table here, you would see a snake. And it's not real. When I was in the Navy, I hypnotized a friend of mine and I told him he was going to see flying saucers to starboard when he was on watch that night. I almost got court-martialed over that because he got everybody and the captain up to come look at these flying saucers that weren't even there. But for him, they were real because I had given him that suggestion under hypnosis and his subconscious mind saw it. Were they ghosts? Were they real? They were ghosts. So. So that's how the subconscious works, okay? So listen to what Mary says. My soul, my soul, my subconscious, doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoiceth in God. Huh. She's talking about soul and spirit. The spirit is your conscious mind. The soul magnifies whatever is put into it by the conscious mind. What you sow, you reap. What you're putting in that soul all the time with feeling because the soul is like a good woman. It re responds to emotion, to feeling. The more feeling you have, the more it picks up the message. Some of the best ways to access the soul or the subconscious is repetition. Okay. How'd you learn your multiplication tables? How'd you learn to drive? Most of you didn't even think about most of your driving here. You, it's all unconscious. You see that? Because it's now working all on a deeper level. It's taken over. When you started out driving, everything's conscious. You learn anything the first time you start. You get on a, you get on a bike or you get on some skates. It's very hard at first because the conscious mind's trying to do it all. And eventually the subconscious picks it up and it becomes natural. It's like an athlete that trains for an event. He does it over and over and over again. And eventually his body is working on an unconscious level. Okay? And that's what the subconscious is about. So there's a lot of ways to access the subconscious. One of them is through hypnosis. Another is music. Unfortunately, that's what's defiling our nation today and our children. The music is here and it's corrupting. If you listen to the messages, the rap music and the different things you're hearing, it's filled with unbelievable profanities and, uh, and dis disrespect for life, for women, and on and on and on. I could go on. So, I think that's ignorance. They have no idea the destruction they're creating. And, and some of it's evil. They just don't care. You know, it's like movies and entertainment. And what makes the dollars? Let's go, the, let's go a little further each time because it'll bring in more dollars, right? It's, it's, it's greed. And no concern for our youth. No concern for what's happening to this country. No concern for the defilement of the minds that it defiles. Okay. So, okay, so 
Okay, for the word is for word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Here again, they're talking about two different things. Back two thousand years ago, soul and spirit, they're distinctly different. Okay, seeing you pure now, get this one. This is what you're all supposed to be doing. Seeing you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of thy brethren. How do you purify your soul? What is your soul? It's your subconscious. How do you purify it? Through unfeigned love. What does that mean? It means a, a real love for your brothers and your sisters. A real, a real love, not a fake love, not a feigned love. I love you if you do this for me. I love you if you buy my product. I'll give you a gift and love you. I love you. Let me give you a gift, but I want you to buy my product. That's love? No, that's not love. That's manipulation. So how do you purify your souls? Through unfeigned love. Oh, but how do you love? Oh, there's an amazing thing here. You can't love others unless you love yourself first. Oh my God, really, Ron? You can't love? No, scripture says a man who loves his wife loves himself. Well, that's a quite an amazing revelation. Because if you don't love yourself, you can't love others. It's impossible. Hmm? Why do you think the scriptures is filled with what? Forgiveness. Why do you think Christ came to talk about forgiveness? Why did, why did the healings of the Bible come through forgiveness? And Paul beheld him. Listen to this. Sound like hypnosis to you? And Paul beheld him with steady gaze and said, Your sins are forgiven you. Get up and walk. Wow. Did he beheld him with steady gaze? I wonder what he was doing. Maybe he was reaching into that soul of that individual and touching him on a level that could heal him. You hear what I'm getting at? That's where healing comes from. The purification of the soul. Does this make sense? The cure for ailments, the cure for all things, you know? So if you look at the planet symbols, you're going to see these three things, the circle, the crescent, and the cross continually. If you look at this on this board, I wrote up very messily, messy, messily, <laughs> is that a word? I don't know. And it's spirit, soul, and cross, the body. Okay. But look at the symbols. The sun is a circle with a dot in it. The moon, double crescent, which is symbolic of their soul, obviously. The sun is your spirit. Then look at Venus. The circle is on top of what? The cross. Right here. Okay, you see that? Venus has the circle on top of the cross. That means that the physical desires and the physical senses are being what? Dominated by what? Conscious mind. Okay? Mars is the opposite. We use a, a, an arrow over a circle, but it's actually a cross. Broken cross, we often refer to it. So what does Mars do? Mars has got the senses dominating the conscious, willful mind. You see the difference? So Mars, <laughs> Mars said, let's get it on, right? Very physical. Let's get it on, you know? And what does Venus say? No, no, let's put love first. See the difference? Let's put love first. Will is ruling what? Will, the sun, the solar symbol, the circle, will is ruling what? The desires. Where Mars is uncontrolled. Mars said, no, let's get it on. I want to I, I wanna have carnal sex. Let's do it right now. The hell with love. You know, I'll pretend I love you, but let's get it on. So that's what these two planets represent. Jupiter's crescent over the cross. That's Jupiter's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's where it came from, Jesus, Jesus. He's called Jesus throughout the world today. <laughs> Jesus. Zeus, where's the Zeus? I'm sure he didn't, my dog didn't come running in. So anyway, so Jupiter is the crescent over the cross. That's the soul dominating what? The senses. A planet of compassion. Because the soul is the feminine receptive soul. It's the feelings. And it has great compassion. That's why Christ was called compassionate. He was a loving human being. He had compassion. Saturn's the very opposite. Look at Saturn. The cross is dominating the crescent. Saturn is no feelings, no, you know, suppress all my feelings. Saturn is Satan, the devil, the serpent, the dragon. That's where it all came from. He's called the subtlest of all the beasts. Interesting name for Saturn or Satan. Subtlety is the subconscious. 
Huh? It's like a good woman, it, you know, influences a man. She's subtle. She's, you know, the man takes credit for it, but the woman's really put the ideas there, right? She's putting them in all the time. But the man, he's gonna, he doesn't want to be influenced. He just surely doesn't want to be told what to do. He doesn't want to be told this is what you're going to do because the conscious, willful mind doesn't want to ever be told anything. But if the suggestions are subtle, a good woman knows how to do that. And she's got a very much power over that person's life and that man's life if there's a relationship there, okay? So, okay, Neptune. Here we have the cross actually piercing the soul. Neptune rules Pisces, the sign of sorrow, self-undoing, prisons, institutions. It rules hospitals. It rules um, monasteries and monks and nuns, people that self-inflict their own lives with what? With self-denial. Their souls are pierced by that cross. You see that symbol? Right here. Now you, now you understand the meaning of these planets. They're not just planetary Neptune. You're not, you, you can get a sense of what they're about. Look at Uranus. It's like two ears out here with a cross in between. We call Uranus intuition. Oh boy, is it intuitive. Aquarians are very intuitive, okay? And then we got the sun on the bottom down here, the solar symbol, the conscious will. And Pluto is this way. Pluto, a lot of people use this symbol for Pluto. I don't recommend it because it doesn't really give the message of what Pluto is about. Pluto is a symbol of, Edgar Cayce called Pluto the planet of Christ consciousness. We usually think of Pluto as death and birth and, re, you know, all that childbirth and, uh, you know, sex and all that. But Pluto was symbolic of a very high evolutionary consciousness. And we have the, the spirit, if you notice, isn't even touching the soul. It's resurrected above it. And the soul is right here and the cross is underneath. It's the most spiritual of all the planets, Pluto. You would never know that from the way you read the astrology books and astrology meetings. Oh, we got two more people. Come on in. Hello, Hi. Oh, you're missing. Uh, come on in. Oh, you're on time because you're here. So. Hello. 